where we go tonight. Um, uh, before I start talking about the pieces over there and over here, I probably won't talk about those so much. Um, I just want to thank the American Swedish Institute for um, you know this room, this beautiful room, and the space and the time to you know have this piece here. Um, it's a real treat to have uh, this piece kind of you know inhabiting uh, an environment like this. Um, so, thanks to the American Swedish Institute, but I also want to acknowledge the Minnesota State Arts Board um, for really giving me the ability to make this piece. Um, if you're not familiar with the Minnesota State Arts Board, they are an entity that helps artists, um, they help a lot of organizations, um, but a couple of years ago when the lightning bolt struck for this piece, which happens never for artists. Um, you know, if, if you're a working artist, I, I just, uh, imagine some of you are here, um, you know that the lightning bolt just never happens. Um, work creates work. You don't, we don't just sit around waiting for that, that inspiration to happen and then go make that piece that you just uh, envisioned. Um, but when, it, I, I, I say that kind of in jest because this piece was one of those pieces that actually I did kind of have that epiphany for. Um, I, I've been working in kinetic sculpture for a while, and the piece, I don't know if you saw it on the way up here in the, they call it the lake downstairs, where uh, there's the, the boat kind of riding on um, the, the same kind of pedestal as this. Um, I finished that piece, and I knew the mechanism to, to create this piece. And so I, I knew that I could kind of expand on that and, and build this. So that really, the lightning bolt did kind of strike, but it was a slow lightning. Um, but I knew that uh, at the same time when I had this idea for the piece, um, nobody was looking, nobody was willing to commission me, nobody wanted uh, a kinetic sculpture with illuminated and, and moving icebergs and a boat hanging from the ceiling. So, uh, you know, there, there was just, and the space, I needed space to, to, to have this piece. Um, nobody was looking for that, nobody was willing to pay me for it. So I went out and went and tried to source funding for this project. And I wrote a, a grant or a grant proposal for with the, the Minnesota State Arts Board, and I'd done a few of these things, and I tried to get uh, funding from them in the past, and I'd always failed. Uh, but the Minnesota State Arts Board deemed this project worthy enough to fund this one, so I thank them for uh, for giving me this opportunity. The first time this piece was shown was up in Grand Marais. Um, in 2018, so not this past February, but the February prior. And uh, it was important to me to build this piece and have it be shown close to the entity, the body of water that it is about. It's about Lake Superior, and uh, it's about climate change. So uh, my family, we, my wife and I, we have a sailboat up on Lake Superior, and I'd grown up uh, going to Grand Marais uh, all my life. Uh, my parents took me up there camping uh, when I was a kid. Um, so I have a real affinity for Grand Marais and I have a real affinity for, for Lake Superior. Um, so I knew that I wanted to um, build a piece about Lake Superior and specifically about climate change. And, you know, we've all seen images of glaciers melting. We've heard the stories um, and we've seen the, the the, the photos of the skinny polar bear kind of wandering around on, uh, you know, up in Greenland or, uh, you know, up in the Arctic. Um, because there's not as much uh, ice uh, up in, on the oceans as there once was. So uh, the polar bears are, they don't have enough to eat. So we've got starving polar bears and we've got melting glaciers. And all these things seem really foreign to me at the same time as, you know, they, these images bring it close to home. You know, they're, they're meant to be, uh, uh, to, to show us what's happening around the world. And, um, you know, they're, they're shocking images and they're, 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 they're meant to, to stir, you know, some kind of a reaction, but they still seem kind of foreign. You know, I've never been to the Arctic, I've never been to the Antarctic, I've never seen icebergs, even though I want to, um, and I've never seen polar bears. So, for me, that's all still very foreign, okay? So, the thought, the lightning bolt that struck for me was, what is happening on Lake Superior? How is ice being affected on Lake Superior? So, when I conceived of this piece, um, I, I, I wanted to, to tie that in, I wanted to tie climate change into the piece. 
And through the funding through the State Arts Board, um, it gave me the opportunity to reach out to uh, researchers and scientists up at the Large Lakes Observatory at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And so I was able to go up there and meet with two very uh, highly regarded uh, uh, researchers. And they showed me around their facility and I got to see their boat. I got to see the, these really cool submersible uh, uh, autonomous kind of drones that, that swim through Lake Superior. They go from one side of the lake to the other all by themselves and they collect all kinds of data. And so I got to see those things and that was really cool. But they, they asked me, they said, you know, so what is it exactly that you're looking for from us? And what I wanted to do with this piece is I wanted to, to create a piece that maybe sort of tied to some metric, some data points. And my thought was that I would maybe have these pieces kind of at all different levels, kind of as a visual graph, uh, depicting some scientific data. I didn't know what that was yet. And so they, they said, what are you looking for? And I said, well, ideally I would love to have um, information or a chart that would show you know what percentage of Lake Superior freezes over every year. Mm. You know, let's go back a hundred years and show me how much of the lake froze over a hundred years ago. And because climate change is happening, things are warming, I assumed that that level uh, would or that, that percentage would decrease. And so I was looking for a chart. You know, give me give me a, a, a line on a graph. And so they, they kind of looked at each other, those two guys. And they looked at each other and kind of snickered, I think, probably under their breath, uh, because I'm not a scientist. And uh, it, that was very obvious. Um, and they said, well, you know, that would be great. We'd love to have that information for you. But uh, 100 years ago, nobody was studying lake ice on Lake Superior. Strike one. Mm -hmm. um, nobody, you know, climate change wasn't a thing back then. I mean, it was in the Vikings, you know, we know that things are changing but we just weren't really paying attention. And so 100 years ago, they didn't have the data, but they said we did start collecting data in 1971. And I said, well, that's still, you know, that's like 40, at the time, it was like 45, 46 years. That's a good amount of time. I thought, well, that, that'll still work. I was actually born in 1971. So I thought, well, that's actually interesting. <laughs> so then uh, they said that the other thing, though, is that we don't, we don't look at the percentage of the lake that freezes over every year. It's not like Lake Superior freezes from the outside and it freezes to the middle and there's a little opening in the middle and we can calculate how big that opening is compared to the rest of the lake. It just doesn't work that way. So I said, well, how, what do you, what, what, what is the metric? And they said, well, we uh, look at the number of ice covered days for any given point on Lake Superior. And my artist mind just kind of went to sleep, you know, because I was trying to figure out what that meant. <laughs> and they said, so what we do is, you know, we have satellites now that can fly over the lake. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have that 100 years ago. So that's new technology that allowed them to start looking at these things. And so the satellites fly over, and they, they take photos every few hours. So they're, they're going around you know, pretty quickly. And they take four or five photos every day. And you can actually go online, and you can look at these images. And I kind of do them when you're with McGee. Um, but... Uh, what they do is they have these points set up. They have a whole lake mapped, and they have all of these uh, latitude, longitude coordinates set up. And they can look at those, those points on the map, and they can see whether there's ice there or not. And, uh, you know, because ice, it doesn't form the way that I just described. It, it forms, and then the wave action breaks it up, and it moves it. So ice on Lake Superior is a moving target. So it's not like it's just stable. It's not like the regular lakes that we all know down here, where it just freezes over and that's it, it's done. Um, so it moves around. So they look at these uh, points and they calculate how many days a year those points have ice on them. So it's a really mushy thing that they're working for. I was looking for really hard data that I could just draw a line and call it good. Um, but what they did tell me is that they can still give me hard facts. And when, in 1971, when, the, when they started the, the, the survey, they said that for any given point on Lake Superior, 47 days a year, uh, that point on that lake is frozen, or there's ice there. So I said, okay, fast forward to today, which was 2017 or 18 at the time when I was meeting with them. And they said, well, so you fast forward to today, and then it dropped to 26 days. 
And so in my lifetime, it had gone from 47 to 26, 25, 26, somewhere in there, which is a pretty dramatic drop in ice cover on Lake Superior. And so then I started to kind of push things a little bit. I said, okay, when does that go to zero? <laughs> and they, again, kind of looked at me snickering under their breath because as these scientists, they work in hard facts and they're not, they're not crystal balls and they're not looking into the future the way I wanted them to look into the future. And so they said, you know, that's just not something that we have. We don't have that data. And I said, but it's a chart, right? We can kind of figure that out. This is called a linear decline model for anybody that wants to know. Um, so you can draw a line through all of these points. And I said, eventually we're gonna get to zero, right? So can you project that out for me? And because the scientists are blind, they, they, they wanna work with facts, and they don't have a crystal ball, they, they just were hesitant, but they said, okay, because you're an artist, here we you. And so they came up with a date, a uh, year, 2065 is the year that on average, the statistical average of ice formation on Lake Superior will not happen anymore. It's 2065. Now that's, the reason they didn't want to tell me this was because there's a lot of variables. Um, things can change, and hopefully they do, um, but there's a lot of variables, and they just said, you know, we don't, we don't work in variables. We work in hard numbers, so it's, it's just a number that we're not comfortable telling to you, but it is the number that's out there. So if we do absolutely nothing, if nothing changes, that's the year that we won't have ice on Lake Superior, but that doesn't mean that it won't ever happen because there's always going to be this statistical anomaly, you know, there's cold weather years, there's warm weather years, we're going to have ice. But that's just the date that, on average, there won't be ice. So it's a big, it's a big number, and that's, that, realistically, that's still within my lifetime. This study started when I was born, and I will be 94 in 2065, and that's still within my lifetime, and that's like a huge, dramatic change in, a, you know, 94 years. So, I wasn't able to come up with a way to take that information and apply it to this. I knew how to make this. I couldn't figure out a way that would make it, that, that would make sense to, to apply some strange metric into this, and it just seemed to be very cumbersome to do that. So I decided that I'm just gonna leave that aside, and I'll talk about it. This piece, if it does nothing else, it furthers the conversation. It keeps the conversation alive. And that's the goal that I have for this piece. Um, not everybody's gonna get it. You know, you have to read didactics. You have to, to actively engage in art, you know, participation uh, to get that. If you come in here and you see this interesting, kind of mesmerizing and, and zen-like structure in the middle of the, the, the gallery space, I'm, I'm perfectly fine if that's the takeaway. But if you go to the extra effort and read the didactic and maybe do a little research, this piece for me is kind of a, you know, it's, it's therapy in some ways. That it, it allows me to have a voice. Um, they say all art is political, and this is certainly political. And um, if th this is my offering to uh, furthering that conversation, that's where I'll leave it. Um, and that's, I think, where I'll leave it. So, thank you all for coming out. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Um, I, like I said, I didn't touch on any of the work in the other room over there. Um, if you have questions about those things, if you want to ask me privately, you can come up and talk to me, but I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.